this was a way of me also being really authentic and trusted, hopefully, you know, continue to be trusted by my followers to say, like, I want you to know, like, I, I live what I preach. Welcome to Give a Heck. I am your host, Dwight Heck, and for much of my life, lived my life in quiet desperation, wondering how I was going to pay the bills, take vacations, save for retirement, and one day wondering if I would get off the hamster wheel of life and have purpose. A life that most of society lives, which takes us to work, then home, then repeat, and pays us hopefully enough just to survive. The harsh truth that most live with more months than money and have no idea how to live life on purpose, not by accident. This ensures the mass majority are living not just financially broke, however emotionally and mentally as well due to financial pressures. In each episode, I will introduce you to thoughts, ideas, and guests that can help you to learn how you too can live life on purpose, not by accident. Good day, and welcome to Give a Heck. On today's show, I welcome Victoria Pelche. Victoria is a 20 plus year corporate executive and board director. She is currently a managing director at Accenture, nicknamed the Turnaround Queen by her former colleagues and employers. Victoria inspires and empowers her team and clients to change mindsets and drive growth in business, leadership, and culture. As someone who does not subscribe to the status quo, she was always ready for new challenges, becoming one of the youngest chief operating officers at the age of 24, a president by 35, and a CEO by the age of 41. Victoria was recognized as one of the 2023 Women of Influence by South Florida Business Journal, 2022 Top 30 Most Influential Business Leaders in Tech by CIO Look, 2022 Most Influential Entrepreneur of the Year by World Magazine, 2021 Top 50 Business Leader in Technology by Insight Magazine, and a Mentor of the Year by Women in Communications and Technology in 2020. HSBC Bank awarded her the Diversity, Inclusion, and Innovation Award in 2019, and she was IBM's number one global social seller ranked by LinkedIn in 2019 and 2020. As a prolific motivational and inspirational speaker, Victoria has delivered keynotes discussing the importance of personal branding and its impact on professional growth, being an empathetic leader in empowering employees, the power of DEI on corporate cultures, and building a life of resilience. I'd like to welcome you to the show, Victoria. Thanks so much for agreeing to come on and share with us some of your life journey. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here today. Yeah, I'm excited for this. Our, our, I always love the pre-talk before I hit record. Gets me a sense of what kind of podcast this is going to be. And listeners, buckle up, hang on. You're about to learn some amazing information from Victoria. And guess what? I get to learn it too. So it's a win-win situation. So Victoria, one of the things I talked about before we hit record, and I'm just going to remind, uh, especially the new listeners that are tuning in. And again, I appreciate you listeners for being here and supporting the Give a Heck podcast and the fabulous guests that I have on. Victoria, one of the things I focus on and for, again, the new listeners is the origin story, because I believe everybody's life is pivoted and changed by those little nuances in life that happen from our earliest memories, earliest recollections from even four or five years of age, all the way up to where you are now, I'd appreciate you sharing whatever you feel comfortable with. Sure. No, happy to, Dwight. And it's, I, like you, really want to understand other people's lived experience and their stories, or in what I, in my case, I refer to it quite frequently as my why. Uh, and so for me, and I wouldn't have always been quite so open sharing the story. Um, it, it comes a lot from the coaching and mentorship and the speaking that I do as I engage with others. I realized um, hiding a part of that was doing a significant disservice um, to those and building really trusted, you know, authentic relationships with and giving the right kind of coaching. So mine is um, fairly traumatic, actually. I'm born to a drug addicted teenage mother who was exceptionally abusive to me. Uh, I was in and out of the child welfare system uh, a number of times, 
Uh, and then ultimately, I'm I am one of the fortunate ones. However, I was adopted, uh, and I was adopted by a couple who happened to have met my biological mother. Um, the last words she uttered while I was in her care was, "Come and get her before I kill her." And she called my my adoptive mother. Um, that is the one. My my mom is the woman who raised me uh, to come and remove me. Uh, and I and she said to Julie, my biological mother, that she wanted to adopt me. And so that one of the most selfless things Julie could have done was to agree to give me up. Uh, but it was pr pretty traumatic, you know, being pushed upstairs, downstairs. Um, although this next one was carelessness versus intention, but I had a cigarette in my eye. I wore a patch for, for months as a child. Uh, and But that scarred me. And that's a big part of my my why in terms of the kind of drive I have. I do believe innately there's, you know, fight or flight, I'm a fighter, um, so there's some, something in my DNA, but also I was determined to be better than biology or circumstance. I'm My parents that raised me, um, although very loving, my mom in particular, uh, was a lo lo lower socio socioeconomic household, you know, so no money, we never went on vacations. Uh, I wasn't even able to go to like my, my senior grad trip as I'm seeing all my friends posting photos of their kids who are graduating. That wasn't in the cards. So I started working at age 11. Uh, I'd never needed to worry about not, ha not having clothes or food, but anything above and beyond that I needed to, to work for. And so that's where a lot of my why, my drive in terms of my performance in career um, and to achieve more and more, that's where it comes from. That's, you know, I like everything you said, you know, to go through what you went through. And I do know, um, I've adopted two kids myself of my five. So I understand that, um, where somebody selflessly gives up their life to raise another child that isn't necessarily biologically theirs, but raising a child and being a parent has nothing, absolutely nothing listeners to do with biology that has to do with your actions. Right. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate the couple that did adopt you. And though you didn't get to have the circumstances of, of, you know, being spoiled, like some kids, it is what it is. Like I know couples and my, my parents are, are a couple that, you know, I found out when I was older and I was just about to be that adult, that so-called numbered adult where you hit the age of majority. We didn't go anywhere. My parents could have afforded it, I found out after the fact, but they believed in a very simple existence. You know, you want stuff to wait, you go out and work. Like I didn't start as young as you as 11, but by 12 years of age, I had a couple, uh, you know, I had a paper route, helped another friend out with a paper route. And then by the time I was 13, I was working for my dad in the summers. He believed in if you wanted stuff, you needed to work for it. You needed to put in the effort that nobody owed you anything except he owed me shelter, food, and, uh, you know, love. That's about it. <laughs> and you know what? And I grew up okay, I think. I haven't, <laughs> you know, I'm still I'm still asking people to validate that, but we'll, we'll see. Maybe you'll validate that later. But uh, <laughs> so I like what you said, though, better than biology and circumstance. Very simplistic, but yet so powerful of a statement. And most people just don't realize that no matter those listening, you can be in the most struggles and trials and tribulations in your life right now today. And you can look at your past, your origin and blame everything on it. Or you can use that as a catalyst, a stepping stone to take that first baby step that you deserve, that we all deserve to live a purposeful life. So, you know, just from Victoria to where she is today, all the research I did on her in the last couple of days, you know, you can pull your bootstraps up. People don't like that statement all the time, but it's true. Sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta pull on your your big person pants and decide that you're not gonna wallow on the on the hamster wheel of life and you're gonna move forward. So thanks for sharing that, Victoria. I really appreciate that. So Victoria, you rose to the top in the corporate world quickly, right? What motivated you, or better yet, what was the biggest drive to achieve so much by the time you were in your forties? It's um, so it's that the phrase where I say better than biology or circumstance, I I didn't articulate articulate what exactly that meant. Sure. I'd love go for it. Yes, that would be good. <laughs> no, I I didn't. It came later. Oh in oh, did okay. It, it, but it was things like I I bought my first house at nineteen. 
uh, wow. which I left for my parents when I moved um, across the um, the country. And sadly, they lost in a bankruptcy several years after that. But um, it so it was what from a financial perspective, it was knowing I I never had to worry. So for me, it was having accumulating wealth and having my own home even at, at, at so that was one of the ways in which I defined it. Uh, I actually wanted to be a, a lawyer. Um, I, I jokingly say, you know, I think I watched too much LA law in the you know 80s and early 90s with my mom. Um, and, and so that was where I was going to go. But I started working while I was in university in a bank and I got promoted in, in a matter of months into a leadership role. Although I'd actually been the assistant manager at the Bata Shoe store I worked at when I was 14 years old. That was my first leadership role. Uh, but when I was working in the bank and I got moved into a leadership role, I was managing complex operations and people. And the complexity and challenge is something that I always strive for. Like I'm not a status quo girl at all. I'll try and break things. I think to put them back together again, that's always kind of innately been there. And so for me, it was around, um, yes, earning more money. Uh, yet I didn't have, I didn't aspire at the time. I didn't say I want to be the CEO of a company someday that that, that vernacular and thinking wasn't there. I just knew I wanted to continue to grow with greater and greater, you know, challenge and complexity Yet that naturally meant that I rose, you know, to a C-suite rank within the, um, the organizations that I worked for. And then it's shifted since then. Even my view on, on money has changed over time. I think I, going back to the origin story, I felt like there was something I was going to prove to the world with material possessions. So, you know, the vehicle I drove and the houses got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and then at some point, um, and I know where that is my, um, so I'm, I'm, I came out as queer in, um, in my teens. I was at 14. I came out as bisexual, married to a woman for 11 years. I'm now married to my, uh, and with my husband for 10 and I have a trans child. So I'm exceptionally committed to the LGBT community and diversity period. My ex-wife, um, uh, was, uh, diagnosed with cancer when I was seven weeks pregnant with our second child. Uh, and so that was number one, saw her battle it. And when we got separated, divorced after 11 years together, um, shortly thereafter, found out her cancer was back and, um, she died a few years later. That was a moment for me in terms of one, I'd actually left her almost everything in our divorce, um, because I was 13 years younger. I had my health and I made more money and I could earn more money. So I literally left her with pretty much everything. Uh, and then. Um, when I saw her die too, uh, and what that meant for, you know, two children who lost a parent, uh, as well, it just shifted a lot of my thinking around what I wanted to do and what I wanted to strive for. So although I did have, you know, vernacular and a goal to be CEO at that point, uh, it was more around what type of company, um, and what type of people do I want to work with? Use the word purpose. So for me, I'm very driven by that. I want to work for and with companies and people um, that align to my own vision, mission, values, and the kind of purpose and impact that I want to have. Yeah, you want like like we meant, we mentioned. It, I don't know if it was for recording or or during so far. Like attracts like, right? And what we give off and energy and who we are is. Are you you know people listening? Are you genuine in your actions? Or are you living a facade? Victoria, you obviously aren't. As you mentioned, you're supporting a huge proponent of supporting the LGBT community. I am as well. I have relatives that have come out as being gay. I know transgender people. The list goes on. I don't care what people, how they want to live their lives, as long as they're um, morally good people. And the number one thing for me is that a person has to be kind. I don't care all you to define yourself and, and exactly what you broadcast to the world is your identity is you, you do you, I'll do me. That's the way I keep <laughs> life. Right. And I'll be all inclusive of you. Right. And we all deserve that. Right. Whether we're a 1% marginalized part of the population or we're the majority and, and so called accepted, I find the majority of the population, you know, this isn't always a favorite thing that people don't like me saying, but the majority of the population really bores me. <laughs> it really <laughs> does because they're on a hamster wheel and, and they're not that they're not good people and they're not doing great things. I have, I live on a higher plane of existence in my brain. I need to be stimulated. I want to be around cool people that are, you know, 
moving and shaking, like they say, and, and doing changes in life and really serving others and serving the marginalized community that's been picked on for so long. One thing I will add, um, and we'll get on to the next thing, unless you have something else you want to add. We talk about the LGBT community, but one of the things is as a, as a single dad of five kids, four of them being daughters and seeing how they've been treated throughout their lives, seeing how my sisters, my mom, and I think women are a segment of the population that have been overlooked far too long. And we need to stand up as a society and quit marginalizing, you know, a gender that is more than half of the population of the world, depending on where you live. Like, come on, quit, quit disrespecting people. But that's just a little side note I thought I'd throw in there. <laughs> right. So oh, I'm, I'm glad you did because uh, and, advocating anything, for- anything you'd like to add to that? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, go, I will go for it. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. You, um, I, I mean, for me, uh, I we're fortunate that you and I both live in North America. The World Economic Forum did a research um, paper, it came out late last year, that said from a pay equity perspective in North America, we're only 60, six zero years away from pay equity. That How horrific is that? But it's 100 plus years in many other parts of the world. I did and not know that. It, it, so, but, so for me, that's just, it is shocking. And it's funny, I, um, I, I had a, a big battle on Fishbowl, uh, which is for those of your listeners who aren't familiar with it, it's an app you can you can download and go on anonymously as part of your company um, or mm-hmm. industry. You can do as well. And Accenture, um, who by the way, I I just left Accenture um, almost two week two weeks ago. Now I'll transition to a new role. But Accenture was doing layoffs, and in Fishbowl, someone you know was in the executive group of, of Fishbowl because there's a separate one. Someone went on to say how discriminated white men are going to be. Um, through the the layoffs that we had announced um, be, around, you know, there, and I was just, I laid sort of into them. And again, it's an, you actually, I think you could choose to pu- publicize your name, but everyone's anonymous on there. But I later went on to post publicly on LinkedIn around that and said, let's stop debating the facts here of the fortune 500 companies, only 53 of them have female CEOs and um, only six black CEOs. And we record this on Juneteenth, uh, Juneteenth to, uh, teenth today. Um, so in solidarity, supporting the Black community today as well. And so, like the the data is the data. And so, as you said, uh, you know, as a dad to four girls and an advocate for DEI broadly, like we have to do more to move the needle much more rapidly than it has been. Well, and it's terrible though. People are manicuring and massaging their responses they live a life of a facade they're not willing to stand up and be counted i remember being my one daughter she's my second oldest she was 12 years old so already having troubles at her mom's and she moved in with me full time and we were having a conversation about marriage and the definition of it and i was raised and i still practice my faith but i practice it as a buffet style i take what i like i leave what i don't as a christian but i said to her she was talking about some people she knew and they and you know they were hoping for legalization at that time of marriage which wasn't legalized yet in canada and she was hoping for it i said well they can do whatever they want they can call it whatever they want but marriage is unity between man and woman and we got into a fight she was 12 Ooh. And I, it, the, the thing is, though, I, when I was done that, it made me think for 24 hours, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I didn't have a conversation with her verbally. I wrote her a letter and saying how I apologized, how I should be more open minded to it. And that was one of the most pivotal times in my life in regards to appreciating people in that community that deserve their shot. They deserve their own definition of of happy. They deserve us not to put our labels on them. And, you know, you bring up the topic of how many little, like how little numbers of CEOs in the top 500. That's, that's sad. It is so sad. I find that some of the best people in my life that I've ever worked with in conjunction, whether it's together in the same business or when I was a consultant doing consulting work, were women. They were more empathetic. They were more in tune with having that, you know, I hate to say it, but it's that touchy-feely thing. Men are always full of 
you know, vibrato and they're always wanting to have that masculine mask on. And I just actually finished Lewis Howe's book today. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Mask, man, mask, masculinity. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been to a few of Lewis's events and you learn so much about the fact of how we're conditioned as men to hide all our feelings. And, you know, I, that's the way I was raised and it, the list goes on. I'd rather I work on it. My daughters, we talk about all the time. I'm always working to be that feminist. I'm always looking to connect more to my emotional. And I had, it was a woman who sat me down and I've had her twice in my podcast. I've met her at a, an event where I spoke at. She was one of the attendees and she's an actual empath coach. And she says, you're an empath. I said, no, I'm not. She says, yes, you are. Here, let's go through these exercises. <laughs> and she says, you're too sensitive. And in, in some regards, you're, it, most men aren't like you. You're not trying to put up a facade. You'll just say it like it is. And I appreciate that about you. So let's let's hone those skills. It'll help you be a better person you know, relationship builder, it'll help you serve more people. So thank you for sharing that. I'm going to check out that fishbowl application as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Right? But I, I, I certainly hope though, that there's more women in power. I would love to see um person running our country, both the U S and Canada that is female. I'm sick of the old boys club. I really am. And I, ha we're going to get into that conversation in a bit. I have <laughs> because I just, <laughs> I, I'm very opinionated because I don't live behind a facade. If people are either going to like me or they don't like me, you know what? There's a fork in the road. I'll go this way. You go that way. And I'm happy. You you do your happy you and I'll be my happy me. And as long as it doesn't affect my friends, family, coworkers, clients, I'm good. Right. Yeah. So, so Victoria, you've received so many accolades from so many predominant media outlets. Were there times that you know, even they seem to doubt your drive and tenacity and you felt like you were just being hurt. You weren't really being hurt or taken seriously and simply just a headline for them to post. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's interesting. I do, I get approached all the time and I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously guarded uh, around awards for individuals or businesses. And because I've seen behind the scenes, how many of them are bought. And so what I will tell you, not a single one of mine has been. Uh, some of the people that have um, awarded me um, the awards that I've gotten uh, are, I think, to, to highlight, they've one, they've asked for compensation or payment. And I'm very clear, I do not. Like you either believe that I'm, you know, deserving of this or not. Uh, and um, and and I, I fundamentally believe I'm confident in myself and, the things that I've been very passionate about around, you know, the right kind of human centered leadership, um, you know, building the right kind of organizational culture to work in DEI, these things. So the, I've been recognized for that. And I do believe it's all deserved. Although I know that I've been approached many times because of um, my followership um, or thought leadership, how many, uh, and because in some cases I've been like the most senior woman at a particular organization. So like, there's a reason why, you know, they'll come, come to me. So I've, I've questioned things, uh, but I've, you know, gotten much more comfortable in my own skin and confident in who I am um, to know that even the times that I, I didn't win. So just in, in Canada, they used to have a, um, so although I live for your listeners, although I live in the U S I'm originally from Canada and there was a top 40 under 40. I so wanted to make that they stopped it for a couple of years and then they restarted it after I turned 40. Uh, so yeah, I was, of like, course I, I was like, Oh, shoot, shoot, shoot. So, I mean, so there's some things that, that I haven't been able to tick off on, you know, the checklist of things that I, you know, would, would like and aspire to. Um, but, uh, I'm confident, um, in who I am and the things that I'm passionate about. I, 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 I go all, all in on. And so I have this saying, you know, where there's conviction, there's capacity. Uh, so I like that. Also, also making the time and space for the things that are mean, meaningful, um, uh, to you. Uh, mm -hmm. but to one last point to that, that question, Dwight, I, I've been asked, like, do I think I've, you know, gotten my seat at the table? Um, because uh, I'm a woman, for example, or part of the LGBT community. I think doors have opened to me because of those things, but I I very clearly believe I've retained in my seat at the table because of my ability to deliver and who I am as a person. Well, that's and confidence, right? And you have to be confident, especially when you're in 
a segment of the population that has always thought that they're handed things, right? Like you were mentioning. And it, it, then there, that's why I brought it up because it's a sensitive subject to a lot of people. And I know my one daughter just got a big promotion. She works, she's the only Canadian that works for an American hedge fund that, that owns a medical chain of companies. And she's been put in charge. She's had like multiple different in that just the last two years uh, promotions. And she, I've asked her that question. She says, yeah, she gets, says, I get flack even from my boss. He, he says, you know, things that are gender, you know, slanted. And she says, you raised me right, dad. I talk to him very politely, but I get my point across. I know how to speak, right? So I get my point across and sometimes they get it. And we have a conversation. Other times they don't, you know, I just do what I need to do to effectively, you know, they hired me to do a job. I'm going to do it to my best ability, whether I'm female or male, right? So I appreciate you sharing that. It's, uh, but you're right. You said the words cautiously guarded at the beginning. You You have to. You have to be cautiously guarded because there's so many people like I've been reached out to and people want to communicate with me and it's because of a certain factor in my life and I get that, but that better not be, be the, I'm more, so much more than the sum of one thing, right? It's, and, and so I appreciate the fact that, you know, you're confident, but you're cautiously optimistic about the fact that people are coming to you for the right reasons. I can't believe in today's day and age, though, they're still wanting people to pay to get press, right? Oh, oh God, it's so rampant. It's right. yeah, it's, it's incredible how how much of that is is out there. But I they mean, do you that, think they do that to speakers too. Like, you want to come speak here? Pay us. We're gonna you're gonna be on a stage, and we're gonna get you lots of business. And I'm just like, sorry, not interested. Exactly. Right. I'm I'm completely the same. Now, when you're, I I mean, there's lots of. Um, maybe you're not paying. There's lots of like free speaking gigs. And when you're new and you want to build up sort of credibility doing it and confidence doing it on stage that I think that's great. But I know I get asked all the time and although I'll, I, you know, will reduce fees for again, causes that I believe in, um, yeah. I, you know, my time, my time is valuable. Oh yeah. Like I know one of my friends that runs events, he keeps them small, 30, 40 people. And in his events, he basically doesn't pay them, but it's an adventure. So there's one day of speaking, six days of let's go hiking, let's go river rafting, let's go racing cars. Like we've done everything because I've gone to these events. It's it's yeah. amazing. Awesome. It's, a, it's a life experience. It's not, let's stand on the stage for 30 minutes, an hour. Let's go into the green room. Let's jump on a plane and leave. It's a, it's completely immersive. So that's the type of things that I look for now, but he doesn't pay him. He just get they get the whole event for free. So they get paid indirectly anyway. It could be an eight or a $10,000 vacation. Right? Right. So, right. so it's all how you look at things, but I appreciate your insight. So Victoria, personal branding is so misunderstood. I know myself, I didn't quite understand what personal branding was until like literally three weeks after the lockdown of the pandemic. And then I was lucky enough that I belonged to some masterminds and have some mentors that taught me and have been continuing to help me. So you speak on this topic often and you're very passionate about it. Can you talk about the key elements of why a personal brand is so important and how does one get started? Yeah, I uh, I learned it when I make that made that jump from the banking world that I was in, where you know dealing with consumers to the world of business to business, and a, the way a lot of that business gets transacted is through you know requests for proposals, but really it's all mm -hmm. about the people and the recognition that people do business with people they like and they trust and they therefore want to do business with. Uh, how critically important that it was. But for me, it was now I'm leading a sales. I'd been primarily operations. And in that first exec role for me, I was leading everything pretty much except for finance. And so that sales and marketing team, which I hadn't led before. And it's like, how do we differentiate ourselves? And when RFPs land on our table, like what, what's going to make it different it's versus just price? Again, it's quality of service for sure, but there's so many other elements. And so that's that's where it started for me. That was like, so I don't think I had the vernacular to say personal branding 20 something years ago. That that came a little later, but really that focus around what's the, the brand of the organization we work for and then the humans that are in, in there because we buy from and do business with people. And 
So the key elements for personal brand are a number of things. And I think where people get it wrong is they focus on this first point, which is your subject matter expertise or the eminence. You know, what is it that you are known for? The functional spe um, specialty or the industry that you're most known in. And then they just kind of leave it there. But the reality is it's, you know, what are your, what are you passionate about? What are your values? Who are you as a, a human uh, for someone? So for me, that's things like the fact that I am a human centered leader. And by the way, I talk about confidence, but I just want you to know, I've made some pretty significant mistakes over my years that I've learned from that have helped me gain, you know, more and more confidence um, uh, in, in who I am now. Um, and so, you know, val values, human centered leader, radical candor, um, to quote Kim Scott, you know, I'm going to be really up, up front and direct with you from a place of care and compassion because I want progress to be made in you individually or, or the situation and moving forward. So those are things that would define me that people would know about me in terms of values. And I talked about others that I'm, you know, I'll advocate for around DEI, et cetera. The next um, component of it is what makes you different? What is your unique value proposition? There's lots of, you know, financial advisors or, cons or, or, or consultants out there. Why is someone going to choose you versus another? So what makes you different? Um, so, okay, maybe you've had 15 years and they've had 10, but there's something else unique uh, about you. And so people need to cra craft that. Um, and then the last part I'd say into that sort of four pieces, what do you want to be known for? So for me, I'll, I'll donate my body to science. So there's not actually going to be a tombstone. If there was, um, they wouldn't talk about the, you know, billions of dollars I've generated for the companies that I worked for and the profitability. It's going to be about the, my legacy is around the impact I've had on all those that I've touched in workplaces and in community and that I've helped, you know, rise others up and drive for, you know, a more equitable world. And so I'll just say those again. So here, the elements of it, your eminence or your subject matter expertise, who you are as an individual, what you're passionate about, your values, mission, what makes you different from others, and then your legacy, what do you want to be known for? And so to get started, like start mapping those things out, put it down on paper and do an audit, by the way, I do encourage people like sometimes you need to pivot um, and course correct. So you talked about, you know, the book you read and the, the mask. So I, I was afraid to show emotion, particularly as a woman um, early in my career. So I got a nickname as the Iron Maiden. Tough business decisions, run businesses successfully, but people would never have seen it, the, the emotional side of me. Yet I'm the one who, you know, cries at the, you know, Sarah McLaughlin Humane Society commercials. Um, they would not have seen that. So pit, you might have to pivot, but do an audit. So find some people you trust who will be radically candid with you and tell you, how do you show up? What is the brand? What are people saying about you when you're not in the room? And then as you craft the narrative and it needs to be authentic, you know, this is not a character in a movie. It needs to be authentic in who you are, but you then your brand strategy over how you're going to go out. And as you said, at post COVID, like in the digital world now, like every, I, I never interview someone or, or get prepared to meet a, you know, potential client or an existing client without having done research online. But now there's so much that lives on there. You can curate that. Make sure that everything you do as you're putting out in the world is speaking to the audience that you're trying to attract and connects back with those four things. And that doesn't mean it's a constant push of your company's marketing materials. You're going to write about things that hit one of those elements. What are you passionate about? What makes you different? Um, as much as what do you do for work and who, who, who are you working for? Yeah, the uniqueness of who we are as people. That's one thing I've learned about with personal branding is who am I as a person? Who am I unique self? If if somebody was to have a little camera watching me in my home environment, am I the same person as I am outside of my house? Am I the same unique individual? Obviously, there's little there's nuanced differences between our home life and our work life. But am I the same compassionate, caring person that I tell Victoria I am or am I just full of it right am I that person and you know being my unique self has become really predominant for me and speaking out for things that I used to not speak out because I didn't want to not be liked right and that happens yeah. so much I think in branding is people are putting up that facade putting that post up 
to, to get the likes, the comments, and they're not just being their genuine self. And they attract all these people that are attracted to that facade. But if they open up the doors of that person's life, they would leave. They wouldn't be there. Right. So yeah. I always constantly work on being my genuine self like you were talking and legacy. I love that because I do a lot of life coaching about legacy and it ties directly to my financial brokerage, my agency and teach. And I teach other agencies for the last 20 years. Like your legacy is work. You're working on it now. You realize that no. And most people are going, well, what do you mean? Well, everything you do is your legacy. And now at the digital age, like you talked about the pandemic, if you typed in somebody's name, what are you going to see? right? What's going to come up about them? That's part of your legacy already. I'll tell people that you don't have to necessarily be that person that somebody types your name and something comes up. But if you're a person that's out and you're um, a critical thinker, you're a thought leader, you're somebody that's speaking on stages, your legacy is real and people type in your name, are they going to see more good? Are they going to see some bad? Are they going to say, well, Victoria says this, but on the other front, she said this two years ago. Right. Everything's it's it's out in black and white. You can't escape it. So I like how you talked about legacy. I, I work I work on my legacy all the time. Even my book that I brought out a couple of years back is part of my legacy play. People think I did that. You know, it's not I didn't do it to showcase myself. It was to leave behind to my knowledge. I didn't want my knowledge or what I say, my music inside of me to die. I wanted it to be around for my kids, grandkids, great grandkids, all the people out there that might randomly want to pick up a book called give a heck and learn how to live a purposeful life. So my legacy has been very planned, but I didn't really think a lot about it. I taught about it, but it didn't really, I, I, I the pandemic was good for me and people are going to go, well, that's crazy. It costs so much. no, it created my brand. It taught me more about how to hit my inner self. It taught me about legacy, you know, and, and that audit thing you talked about. Do you audits in yourself? I agree with Victoria. I belong to a couple masterminds and each one has their different place in my sphere of my life of what I'm trying to do. And they better not be yes masterminds. <laughs> they better be masterminds. They're going to challenge you. They're going to say, you know, you're full of it. What? You did what this week? <laughs> right. So I, I can appreciate what and concur with what you said that, you know, personal branding has been what a roller coaster ride for me and the stuff that I've been learning and I've been able to implement within my own my own financial practice and even um, my coaching the lifestyle coaching business. It's those little nuances of just being the real you. Right. Don't live a facade life and just, you know, you're going to offend some people. Oh, well. Yeah. Well, it I is think what it is. The authenticity um, piece of it is critical. So I um, I sign a lot of my social media posts with hashtag unstoppable and the other one's no excuses. And those are like my motto and unstoppable is the name of a book that I helped co-author. I live that way. And, and I think a lot of what you see, you know, I post online and I was very fortunate to, you read in my bio, win a lot of awards. And I think a lot of people had this like that maybe didn't know my origin story, um, but they see, you know, that I'm pushing around unstoppable yet. Like what kind of challenge am I having to face? So at the beginning of the new year, um, I published a post for um, like reflective of 2022. It was a horrific year for me on the personal front between my younger one who's actually bipolar and like a massive up and downs last year to my husband had a serious back surgery. My father-in-law passed away super suddenly. I had an accident and lived in a wheelchair for months, multiple wow. surgeries last, last year, had some, you know, challenges from the work perspective. So when I, I wrote in early 23 around that, um, a little bit to, to do this level set. Like I think, you know, people see, and I'm, you know, in media all the time and, uh, and they see a lot of positives, but I just want to reset that we all like have setbacks oh. and it, the way we approach it. And, you know, that having a healthier level of resilience, like that was critical for me to share so openly. And I did it on LinkedIn, like, um, right. Which I tend to keep to, although there's personal elements of it, um, you know, and things connected to businesses, this was a way of me also being really authentic and trusted, hopefully, you know, continue to be trusted by my followers to say, like, I want you to know, like, I, I live what I preach. And here's 2022 is the most recent example of that for me. 
Well, and that's amazing that you did that. So many people, vulnerability gives us the ability to connect. I know I've heard many cases. I've talked to people, you know, think about 21 years in the finance industry, doing workshops, sitting with families, sitting with corporations, sitting with boards, the list goes on. The ones that were vulnerable are the ones that are the people that are continuing to pivot and move forward in life because somebody that's listening to you, reading you, like reading your book or reading your articles and stuff, you could be the catalyst for them to not commit suicide. And this, you know, sensitive subject, for those that are listening, I'm sorry, but it's true. I've had people reach out to me. I have had circumstances in my life where somebody's words, whether they knew me or not, pivoted my mindset and made me want to, you know, live life. And I've had that same experience where people have reached out to me where I've been a pivotal moment and change in their life. So, you know, on behalf of everybody, thank you, Victoria, because that really does make a difference in people's lives. You sharing your 2022 and all your trials and tribulations whether you know it or not, somebody read it and was affected by it and now is moving forward in life, right? So thank you. Appreciate that. So Victoria, relationship-based selling in my industry and many others is based on focusing on the transaction and not the people. I understand what it is and I utilize it myself as the key to actually serving people properly, which is the relationship. Can you please explain what relationship-based selling is and why is it key to any business success and longevity? Well, the precursor to that is personal branding, let's just say, right? So you're going to start to develop relationships once you have an established brand and people, you know, connect and research and whatnot with you. So that's step one. For me, um, I, I use I said this earlier in, in your in, in the podcast here, people do business with people they like, they trust, and they want to do business with. And so for me, I've worked for far too many companies that, um, you know, are, as you said, very transactionally focused. Here's the sales number. You got to go out and get it. And then what I see is like salespeople walking around with the proverbial toolkit of like whatever widget, um, you know, that, you know, they're, they're selling or pushing and without understanding the, the people who are buying it. So understanding um, you know, the individuals, like what's the, what's the strategy of the organization and that they're in, in particular accountable for and the pain points they're having. I always, you know, will ask like, how is success measured? And for you personally, so if I'm going to help you solve this problem, tell me how you're going to get your bonus this year by achieving on that. What does that look like? Is that like productivity savings? Is it like, you know, customer satisfaction scores? Like help me. And then I'll, I can walk back into my organization and with my team and see what, what value we can turn around and deliver. And for me, that means I like when I first meeting a client, it's about building a relationship. I want to understand you've got five children, right? I want to understand more about your children. You said you're a single, like dad, tell, tell me a little bit more about that. Must've been so challenging. Like I do, but I do, I do that from a, a like a, a place of like authentic connection built. Like I want to do that. Yes, I recognize that there's potential for us to do business together, but I'm doing it because you're another human I want to get to know. Um, and therefore we, we're actually going to want to work together. And so that's a lot of what I've been trying to teach my teams for years. The challenge comes in most of, most of my career has been in Fortune 500 publicly traded companies that are focused on quarter to quarter results. And many of those companies will not give you the time to build those kind of relationships. They want results like this. And so I find, um, you, know, I, you know, I talk about doing the right thing. Um, and from a relationship sales perspective, um, that that's a struggle. And so what I see is there's like this myopic view to just go and deliver against those numbers, and do all kinds of like, make all kinds of trade-offs and things that I wouldn't um, necessarily encourage. Um, you know, from a, a strong relationship based sales perspective. So I'd tell your, you know, listeners to, um, you know, build authentic, trusted relationships with people, understanding deeply the strategy and pain points that they're dealing with and how success is measured within their organizations and for them personally, as you then try and create um, and bring solutions to the table, whether that be products or services. 
and now we see an average of only two years tenure within. So people are moving around. So if you build that trusted relationship, the opportunity and propensity for you to continue to do you know business down the road uh, is is there. Uh, and the other interesting thing I would just say to think about, um, and it's not just that this one unique single buyer, there's two two books I'd recommend. One is called The Challenger Customer, and that's just understanding the different buyer types in organizations. And the follow um, on to that um, is the, um, sorry, the first one was The Challenger Sale. Um, the next one was The Challenger Customer. That's the follow on. And that one talks about, particularly in a business to business environment, um, it was CES who put out the uh, the publication. Um this is a number of years ago now, they said 5.3 buyers um, or decision makers for every transa transactional purchase that's being made in this B2B environment. So not only understanding the buyer types and again, what motivates them, um, but you're now having to network um, and build relationships with five, six, 10 other buyers um, to help, particularly when you're in an enterprise type sale, like I, I typically am as well. Um, so it's become even more challenging. Yeah, I like how you put though that it all starts with personal branding because bottom line, just all of a sudden becoming a relationship-based connector isn't as easy as just sitting down and saying, hey, you know, hey, Dwight, you have five kids. Tell me about that. You have to tap into your inner self. You need to understand vulnerability and creating a personal brand, whether it's for within a business structure or just for yourself it requires vulnerability. It requires people putting their emotions, I guess, their heart on their sleeve, at least. And I, I think it does. So, you know, bottom line in my life, um, just, just my business itself got better in relationships. And all of a sudden, like you talk about initially, you, you, you there's going to be a transaction, your hope. But my genuine self, the more I became vulnerable and I shared stories of my own life or i'd have a client that i'd share their stories with another client obviously no names or data involved but just the story to connect and res you know to make that touch that emotional connection through my vulnerability has made a huge difference and story you talked about the story the, the fact that everything is like and trust right and it's so true but in order for people to like and trust my clients or people I'm coaching outside of my finance clients, if I don't connect to them, just asking them simple questions, it's about, I don't know if you agree with this or not. When we present ourselves, we have to present ourselves using our body language, our tonality, the words we use. Like I, I believe in wordsmithing in the sense that you can say something one way and it offends somebody use different words and present it a different way. And they're like, okay, I get it. Right. So how, how much do you think is that needs to be practiced in regards to that relationship based selling? Does a, do how, how involved are you obviously with books and stuff, but how involved do you think the people listening need to be in regards to personal development in their lives? And do you have a starting point that you think they should start at if they've never thought about it before? Uh, around which part the their their per, brand or the relationship bill they're or just their all of it their personal branding the relationship selling they've never done personal development but all of a sudden they want to create a personal brand they want to do relationship marketing do you have a starting point that you would recommend for people to start in regards to developing their own personal well, development I, process i will tell you from a personal brand perspective there it's never too soon my older child, he's 23 and just coming out of college and going to get um, a job. And I'm like, buddy, you, you need to get on LinkedIn. And he's like, mom, that's for old people. And I'm like, well, dude, that's where the people who are going to hire you are. And so you're going to need to continue. So I had to giving him, you know, some advice over what, you know, his early, early brand in, in, in a corporate setting is going to look like. So I'll tell your listeners, it's never too soon, nor is it too late quite honestly, uh, you know, to do that. So go through that process we we talked about in terms of crafting through those like four different points and get doing an audit and, you know, and then developing a plan. So start from wherever you're at right now, but just start is what I would say. Around relationship-based selling, I think, uh, although there's some real strategy to how you do that. And um, there's a book um, called uh, by uh, Keith Ferrazzi, Never Eat Alone. He's a shameless self-promoting consultant in that book. 
put that aside, he, the way he talks about being really strategic around who you network with, going back to that 5.3 buyers for, you know, um, uh, people involved in that, in the process, he talks about like some, you know, the strategic nature of that. And I, I like to use the phrase strategic intentionality. And so that, so figure out who you need to meet, but come at it from a place of building just like you're, you're going to meet a friend. You're you know, going to go out to wherever you choose to socialize, whether it's a, a bar or the hockey arena, or wherever it is, but you're just going to go out and you're just going to meet with people who have common interests and that ideally, hopefully you both like one another. Uh, and so that actually doesn't take a lot to put together from a personal development perspective. I think the personal brand is a little bit more work to pl plan it out. And then just being, you need to be consistent, consistent with it and relevant and out there publicly. There's um, what I would also tell, um, I think the bigger challenge for many people listening would be those who are more introverts uh, because, um, the, you know, a lot of this comes with things that would, would make the natural introvert uncomfortable. And even for me, I mean, you, you, you see me and your listeners hearing me, I'm this like, crazy extrovert now, but I wasn't always. Um, in fact, I had to lean into some of the things that made me really uncomfortable. And, you know, we're talking 20 something years ago and going up to, you know, conferences and like group of people and like doing small talk, that wasn't like natural or innate for me. Now it is, I've just forced myself to do it. But I think there's a whole heck of a lot of electronic courage that can come to do this, even for the introverts who are listening here today. Uh, you know, there's a lot that happens behind the screen. Now you need to bring it as my younger one will say IRL in real life as well. Um, but you can start from behind on a keyboard. That's certainly how you develop your plan and strategy and all the research in terms of who you're going to network with. Uh, but you will eventually need to get that into the real world. And even if it's, you know, video conferences, you know, now that we've, we're so, you know, um, geographically disparate and we can do so much more, um, whether it's that or still taking it, you know, in terms of other, you know, in-person networking. So I'd say, develop the plan around the, the brand, be strategic and intentional over who it is you want to be networking and engaging with, but developing personally um, on how to be a more effective relationship-based salesperson uh, has just a lot to do with trying to engage in a very different way from a place of like friendship and caring compassion. And then ultimately um, some of those are gonna turn into, you know, transactions from a business perspective for us. That was a great response, I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, you talked about introverts. I used to avoid any form of uncomfortable conversation. You know, I'd get asked, you know, can we interview? And I'd like walk, or I see a camera, I'd walk across the street, or if I'd be at a conference, I'd hide. Right? I didn't want to. I didn't want to be that person showcase. So I've gotten to a point like yourself being extroverted, but I'm extroverted when I need to be. Otherwise, I'm still the introvert that I always was. It's just those listening, you know, it takes challenges. It takes work. It will be uncomfortable. I'm not going to say it won't be, but on the other side of our comfort zone where success always is, the grass is greener on the other side. It is a total different, I, 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 I see things differently. I can look at the same thing that I looked at 10 years ago when I thought I had it, when I thought I was doing the right personal development stuff and the relationship building stuff, and I thought I had it made and I thought I had arrived. And 10 years later, in the development of my six inches between my ears, it looks so much different. It's like I put on a different pair of rosy glasses. <laughs> it's just like, it's, I can't explain it, listeners. Just trust me. One of the biggest things you got to understand when you're going through any of these processes, enjoy the journey. You need to, you have to actually reflect on your day every day. And those little points, if you have a bad moment, what went on? What am I going to do different tomorrow? Focus on not having bad days. Focus on having opportunities to develop your six inches so that you can serve others. If you always make it about others, you will fail too. You have to make it about you. Your personal development is so important because in order to serve others, you need to be right. Right. And you can't be right every day. I am certainly a work in progress the rest of my life. But I appreciate your response. Listeners, you know, this this might be one of many episodes that you need to rewind to listen to the whole thing or specific points again and take notes. Um, I find pen to paper. I know people get tired of hearing this, but pen to paper, taking notes, even if it's bullet point, actually effectively reprograms your brain in a quicker function than just listening or reading. So 
I'll get off my soapbox again. Um, so <laughs> Victoria, being an empathetic leader and empowering so misunderstood people in today's business world, I believe empathy is key in developing long-term, successful, resilient culture and community. What have you discovered and implemented yourself to develop a culture of empathy to ensure a diverse and inclusive workplace? So I, I think one of the most important factors in building empathy is a little bit how we started this entire podcast in terms of understanding the origin story or lived experience. And that, but also really connected to building really trusted relationships with people. And so for me, you know, that as a leader, that means I need to be comfortable being vulnerable. I need to share openly so that I create a safe place for others to recognize that they can do that as well. And so that's been really critical to me in terms of building not only the right kind of leadership teams, and I use the phrase human-centered, heart-centered leadership. Uh, and I think some people think that it comes with a trade-off for or, you know, performance. And this is where, you know, all mask, all business, all the time that had the nickname of Iron Maiden wasn't doing it well in her 20s um, as a leader, because I was afraid, quite frankly, uh, I was afraid of fear uh, of rejection of like, if I told my true story, I was afraid of showing vulnerability or emotion, because as the one of the only female executives was I going to be thought of differently. So again, I had to, you know, pivot from that, but where the world opened up for me um, from a leader and business success was starting to do that leadership um, and um, very differently. And so being incredibly open and learning to ask the right kind of questions of my team to build trust, to gain deep understanding of their goals and objectives for their own personal and career development, et cetera. Uh, so doing that has created an incredible amount of employee engagement and satisfaction, which in turn has driven strong business results. And so when I spent, I spent time coaching other like C-suite executives and they believe that there has to be a trade-off for some of these um, leadership traits, one or, and, or some of the things around diversity, equity, and inclusion, that by doing the right thing, that there's going to be, a, there's, they're going to suffer in business performance. But to the contrary, there is data that shows that this actually bring, whether it's, you know, greater diversity in the workplace and a more inclusive environment is shown to create more innovation, faster problem solving, higher employee engagement, and therefore productivity, which drives both top and bottom line numbers. So it, it's not just the right thing to do for the humans involved. It's actually the right thing to be doing for our, our businesses. Uh, well, feeling inclusive is important. And you, you mentioned about the fact of communicating with the staff and being more vulnerable, more open and stuff. So if you're starting in a new leadership position with a group, do you sit and talk to them as a group and, and be open? Or do you start doing it in an individual basis with smaller teams or like, where would it start? Uh, I, I think both is required and it depends um, on the, the order of which really depends on the situation. And so I, for, I've been a part of 18 merger or acquisition transactions wow. directly for the companies I work for. I've also consulted with clients to help them with theirs. And in many instances, like for the company that's being acquired, like everyone's nervous. What does this mean? My, is my, my, there, there's an expectation for synergies and reorganization. And am I going to be impacted? Am I going to lose my job? I immediately want to get in front um, in those kinds of situations to have a, a meeting with the group to tell them to the extent that I can, or I'm able to as transparently what I know and what the plans are and how we're going to get them involved in this going forward. I want to allay a lot of their fears. And so, you know, my choice is always in, in really difficult situations like that, where there's massive transformation or change to get in front and share as directly and transparently as I can with the broad group. And then I want to have one-on-ones with people to start to answer the questions they might've been afraid to put their hand up and ask in those larger group settings, or there wasn't time for, to get to know them personally, to understand 
um, the institutional knowledge that they have and how we can leverage that and make them feel like they can be a part of the team. Uh, and also to honestly acknowledge um, when I when I don't have the answers as well. That I find builds as much trust as you know being open, honest, and truthful around whatever information I do have to say, I don't know what I don't know, but I'm going to commit to get the answer to you and come back to you. Um, you know, what, once, once I have it or have you part of the process to help me figure it out. Um, and so, you know, those, and I'm, I'm talking about, those are sort of like bigger events or transactions, but just, so you know, Dwight, that's actually my, I, I commit to for my direct reports. And then I often have what are called skip levels, so like my direct reports, direct reports. I want them to feel comfortable to come to me as well. But I have set um, one-on-one -on -one meetings in the calendar. I'm very clear with them. That does not mean that's the only time you come and talk to me. It just means we are committing to have this time in the calendar for us to get together one-on-one, -on -one, uh, not only to talk about what's happening in the business and provide updates to one another, but from a career coaching perspective, because I'm not a fan of doing like the annual performance review cycle and you've not had any dialogue throughout the year either to understand. Now that's what, broken. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I hate it. I'd rather let's just, we're doing this regularly, you know, on, on the fly, although an appropriate context setting and with you know, not with audiences around. Um, but by the time we get to, if there is a formalized process that most large companies have fine, but at that point, it's just really reconfirming the conversation we've had throughout the year and what your associated rating and bonus is going to look like. What a great, what a great leadership um, process though. You're not trying to be the know-it-all. You're trying to understand this is this person's strength. This is this person's strength. And really, I know some people don't like this, but a, a good leader is like a coach, a coach of a hockey team, because we both know hockey or even it's baseball or whatever, isn't necessarily playing on the ice, isn't on the field, but is coaching all the talent and all the resources they have and understanding the nuances of where they're at and putting them in the right place. And if all of a sudden they're not playing properly, I see that in business with the businesses that I coach too. And you sit down with that person, you sit down with that player in sports, something's going on between their six inches. So then you have to have your empathy switch and you have to have that conversation because you know their talents there, their resources they offer are there, but they need a good leader. They need somebody that's going to lead them past that you know, that little stress point in their life to perform at the level that they deserve to perform at, right? So I appreciate all your insights. Victoria, if you had to give our listeners one last closing message, what would you tell them in regards to giving a heck and never giving up? <laughs> um, I um, would say, go, I'm going to steal from some of the things we've talked about uh, sure. around the, the personal brand piece, I say, you know, the second part is what are you, what are you passionate about? You know, what, what, what's your purpose? So I would tell going for the give a heck, I choose to um, do things that bring me personal or professional joy or value. And for those that don't, I say, no, I delegate or I outsource, you know, you're for your audience, you are the CEO of brand you. And so what I'll tell you is follow um, your joy and your passion. Get, that is giving a heck for me. Uh, but then the other is my mantra of being unstoppable. And being unstoppable means that I live a life of no excuses. That does not mean we don't deeply feel the emotion when challenge, trauma, or adversity comes our way. But once we've lived through that emotion it, um, for whatever time frame that is, uh, we need to make a choice in terms of how we are going to move forward. And for me, that's anchoring back to a goal or objective I have that's connected to purpose and power for an impact and legacy for me. Um, and being incredibly self-reflective and aware in case I need to pivot or change and I need to do something differently because of that obstacle that's come my way. So I think your listeners, your, your CEOs of your own lives. And I think there's a lot of things you can do that will just make, you know, the challenge of life more not only rewarding but easier to walk through some of the the obstacles when they come our way i love it thank you thank you for that great last closing message thank you for this whole conversation it's been it's been amazing it's been en enlightening and i think i mentioned to you before we hit record i know on a podcast is going to be a hit when i get that I get that feeling that fuzzy feeling where it's just you know i feel glad i feel grateful 
that I've been blessed to have you come into my life and I have the ability to ask you questions, have you share your knowledge and being vulnerable to help one person. Hopefully it helps more than one, but that's the goal here is to change one person's life. Um, and my mantra is helping people live life on purpose and not by accident. Mm -hmm. And I certainly think you've accomplished that today for our listeners. So thank you so much for being on. Uh, any last comments that you'd like to make? Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Oh, you're welcome. So our time's almost up. I want to respect our listeners. What's the best way that they can reach you? I have a personal website, which is victoria-peltier.com. And from there, your listeners can choose to link out and connect with me on whatever their desired social platform is from there. Sweet. I'll make sure that goes in the show notes. For the people that are new to the show, go to giveaheck.com. Go into the podcast portal, you'll see Victoria's face. And below that, you'll see the show notes and you'll be able to access information in regards to reaching out to Victoria and either enhancing where you're currently at or starting on that, taking that first baby step to developing the best version of yourself. So thanks so much for being on Give a Heck, Victoria. I appreciate your time and sharing some of your experiences so that others too can learn it is never too late to give a hack. Thank you for taking time out of your day and listening to Give a Heck. If you find value, I'd appreciate you sharing with your friends and family so they too can learn how to live life on purpose, not by accident. So you do not miss the next episode. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and please also post a review. I look forward to reading your comments. This has been Dwight Heck. If you want to check out other podcast episodes or today's show notes, please check out my website, giveaheck.com. And until next time, together let us all strive to give a heck.